Hello and welcome to this hot take where I potentially annoy all of the uh, dear friends that I have in the GNOME pro project and probably some of the dear friends I have at Red Hat by criticizing and giving my opinion on uh, a recent four-part, and I think it's going to be more than four-part series called Community Power uh, by Tobias uh, Bernard. I think he's a designer in the GNOME project, if my memory is correct. I think it's always hard to tell because jobs in the open source world can be very fuzzy. Um, the first thing is, as an Inkscape programmer, many of the things that Tobias uh, mentions in the blog role are very familiar to me. We have very much the same kinds of restrictions in the Inkscape project to do with things like resources, to do with uh, you know how you share uh, decision-making power, who you include in decisions, how you go about including people who have ideas that may not be, even be compatible uh, with the way that the project's consensus wants to be able to develop. And there are some very difficult decisions to ha that you have to be able to make uh, if you are in a leader leadership position. Um, so some of the solutions that Tobias has in his uh, blog are pretty much the same ones that we would have come to in the Inkscape pro project. But I disagree with some of the design conclusions when it comes specifically to the community. So the first thing I want to say is that the GNOME product is fine. I've used GNOME for a very long time. I think that they produce a pretty solid desktop. I have gripes. They're not that important, but that's okay. Um, but more specifically, the main issues are to do with the community. So when I see a uh, an open source project, uh, what I see is a set of promises that the project makes about what it wants to be for the people who either want to use it or want to contribute to it. And a lot of the, should we say, grumbling about the GNOME project actually comes from the fact that GNOME's old promises and what people think GNOME should be promising is definitely not what the GNOME project are promising to today. Um, it used to be the case that the GNOME project's uh, problem that they were trying to solve, their goals, were to basically be a free software uh, desktop platform and uh, being able to enable lots of different applications to be developed is you know, uh, definitely a part of that mission. But as time's gone on, this uh, idea about being both a free software community and being a, uh, a platform has, has faded away. And instead, what, what's happened is the GNOME idea has turned into being a product and turned into being a desktop. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but it means that the, the promises about what users should expect from it have changed. And I suspect that that's a lot to do with the kinds of blog posts that we're seeing, the communications that we're seeing out of contributors for GNOME. And it's probably what makes it very tiresome for GNOME contributors to have to constantly repeat about why people are mismatching what they think the GNOME community should be. And... Um, I don't think the GNOME Foundation is looking after a community. Uh, this is a hot take, f fair warning. I think they're, lo they're looking after a worker-owned cooperative, right? If you don't know what a worker-owned cooperative is, it's basically the idea that the people who work for a business, they buy in through their labor into the ownership of the company. And through that ownership, they're then able to do things like vote, right? So you get a decision on how the, the company moves. And a community is different from that, right? A community is sprawling and organic, and there are things happening all over the place, and it's chaotic. And there are surprising things that happen that are good and surprising things that happen that are bad and madness and conflict and resolution and friendship and happiness and hugs. And, you know, it's community. Uh, what happens in a worker on cooperative is very different, very structured. You, you, you have people who are inside, people who are outside. You have a pathway that you have to attain in order to become a part of the inside group. 
And once you're in on the inside group, then you are given more uh, capacity to make decisions, more trust to uh, make things like vote. And um, you may even be given other things like a, the ability to use the trademark, the ability to use the name to declare yourself a certain kind of special somebody uh, to the outside world. Right. So, for example, a great example of this kind of approach is uh, if you became an Ubuntu mem member back when the Ubuntu community was the thing, uh, you could use the Ubuntu trademark on things like business cards. You could say, like, I'm a community uh, Ubuntu community mem member and, uh, you know, you get those privileges. Um, you could only do that if you had sustained and continual contributions to the Ubuntu project. And that's definitely a buy-in, right? That's not a community operation. It's not really a community operation. Community should be open to everybody. Community is not something that you should have to gatekeep, right? But if you're operating a resource poor, resource restricted, and let's, let's should we say like hyper-focused project where you've got all of these restrictions where you just cannot spend time on people's mistakes, people's fantasies, people's learning opportunities, all of these like chaotic things that happen in a, in a community. You have to figure out ways of restricting things. And, um, and I think the, the GNOME project has chosen a pathway that they want to go down. Um, although I don't think they've quite re self-realized what it is that they're doing. Uh, which is fine. I think like a lot of times people do community development and community management and they're not necessarily understanding the structures that they're putting in place. Um, one of the things I would love for the GNOME project to do is uh, invest more time in community building um, as, a, as a matter of like culture. One of the things that I personally have noticed is that when I interact with uh, people from the non project, even though I am a very long standing contributor to free and open source community, um, it, none of that matters. It's like you talk with people and you're getting a, an exasperated sigh of like, why are you bothering to like report this issue to me? Or like, why are you asking this quick question? It's stupid. It's a, it's a bit of, it's a bit caustic is what I'm trying to say. And a lot of that has to actually go into the kinds of uh, community design decisions that are being made. And you can see in Tobias's blog, these are exactly the things that he's counting as being positive things, right? They're uh, methods of exclusion, which are designed in actual fact to make the process more streamlined and make it more specific and focused and so on. You know, you must better well have resources to commit to the project or just don't bother. So your casual user is left, or a casual contributor, I should say, is left sitting there going, what am I supposed to do, right? My opinions don't count, my opinions don't matter. And according to Tobias, they don't matter, right? If you're not a, if you're not a per person with significant amount of skill and resources to be able to invest in the number project, your opinion simply does not matter, right? But the GNOME project, like most open source projects, could actually fix this. And they could fix this by, um, inviting users that have no skill and don't have a lot of money to contribute to things like st structured funds, right? That says that they are a contributor to GNOME that gives them a voice into the project, right? Because I don't care about donations. I don't give a, I don't give a flying F about putting money into a, into a, into the GNOME foundation so it can do whatever it thinks is okay. I want money in free software to serve the users who are giving you that money. And unfortunately, a, the, a great deal of the users of free science and software simply don't have millions of dollars to contribute towards having their wishes fulfilled. But there are millions of users with single dollars who, if pooled correctly, and if a community could be built successfully out of them, could provide a route into having the resources available. So when Tobias says that, so for instance, adding preferences costs resources, yes, it does. And it's reasonable to expect those re resources to be paid by the people that want those preferences to exist. But the GNOME pro project is not on a path of inviting people to contribute the resources necessary. It's on a path of exclusion where it removes people from having an ability to have a say, right? It's not invalid. It's just different. It's certainly not community. So my opinion is that I, th I think the GNOME project is heading in the wrong direction from a community perspective. 
I think it's heading in the right direction from a technological perspective. I think the GNOME Foundation could do a lot more uh, in becoming less corporate and more community focused. But that's really on them to make a decision about what they want the community to be and stop fretting about what they want the technology to be. So anyway, thank you for listening to my uh, rant. And I do apologize if my uh, <laughs> ill-advised opinions <laughs> have upset you. I don't mean to upset anybody. This is uh, my very not well dra dra drafted thoughts. Martin from the future here. Um, I just realized that I omitted one uh, very important counterexample uh, of my argument, which is the outreachy project. Uh, project Outreachy is a GNOME initiative to uh, include more diversity, especially with women and uh, non, uh, typically non-included groups. And uh, we've actually worked with them with Inkscape, and they're an incredibly positive force in the free software world. And they definitely grew out of the kind of thing that I was talking about when it comes to involving not just uh, invitations to participate, uh, but also funding, also structure, also mentoring, uh, and many other of the like positive elements. Now it's still a very structured pro program, so it's not quite the uh, the ultimate chaos that I was uh, alluding to when I talk about community as a whole. Um, but honestly, if the Gnome Foundation like scaled that up or like did more things like that but that were um you know more w wider um i think they could solve a lot of issues um you know like all open source pro projects have glass ce ceilings that are can quite often uh, prevent contributors from being able to contribute their resources their time their effort to your project uh and just like that there's a there's a limiter stopper that stops people from being able to contribute even small amounts of things like money or time to pro projects too, uh, simply because it takes organization. And um, the work done by uh, people like Marina and Sage and, and others who uh, put together Project Outreachy um, just goes to show, show you that it is possible to uh, to engage community and do um, you know a proper look at how you can get new contributors, new users, new involvement and new voices into a project and having more voices making decisions uh, is really what we want. Um, so thank you very much and uh, apologies for having to add this on to the end. It probably looks weird. It's, it's, it's dark now. Um, so have a very good night everybody. <laughs>